Welcome. My name is Colin Gardner. I'm a research associate at the GSD. Uh, thank you all for being here to celebrate the Dualism's exhibition opening. Um, we have a fascinating conversation lined up for you and a few presentations. Um, Iñaki Abalos, chair of the Department of Architecture and Renata Sentwick's design critic in architecture at the GSD are well established in the school and are familiar to everyone. So I'll say a little by way of introduction, but rather mention that this is a unique occasion. Their work has been celebrated in group shows at the MoMA, including light construction, groundswell, and on site. They recently curated the Spanish Pavilion for the 2014 Venice Biennale. But today is unique because Dualisms is their first solo exhibition in North America, and it's an honor to have that here at the GSD. Um, we're also honored to have Enrique Walker joining us tonight. Enrique is based in New York. He's an associate professor at Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Preservation, and Planning. Um, and he's a visiting associate professor at Princeton School of Architecture. He's an author of many articles and books, including Shui on Architecture, Conversations with Enrique Walker in 2006. Um, I'd like to also mention that Enrique will be returning to the school in a few weeks for the second event of the Harvard Symposium on Architecture, Design Techniques 2, which will be happening on February 19th with the generous support of the Harvard Center for Green Buildings and Cities. Now, I add this reference to design techniques because the symposium and the dualisms exhibition share a subtle connection that I'd like to amplify just for a moment. Um, Inyaki and Renata, for them, dualisms is much more than a curatorial device. It's also a design technique that they use in their practice. Dualisms names an undercurrent that has surfaced through their work and which found expression in the exhibition that we are here for today. So it is a particular answer to a broader disciplinary question. And so the conversation tonight has this dual aspect that is both separate from, but also fully ensconced within the spirit of the Design Techniques Symposium. All of which is to say that we can anticipate an intriguing and intricate conversation with three incisive architectural thinkers. So we'll start first with a presentation from Inyaki and then move to a conversation led by Enrique Walker and open to questions afterwards. So please join me in welcoming Inyaki Abalos. Well, thank you. Thank you, Colin, for this presentation. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. <clears throat> and Ben Prosky and all the people of the Department of Communications and Exhibitions for doing all the work and doing it so fine. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm going to be short, first of all, <laughs> so don't worry. <laughs> and But I, I, I want to, to begin saying um, that um, uh, we want to, to, to have an informal format. I mean, we are more used to the art exhibition openings that have like wine, gossips, tapas, and let's say it's a kind, it's not, I mean, I don't know exactly why the architects have to be so profound and to, to say so many things just when they saw the drawings. No, so I don't want to go too deep into our work. And in fact, what I'm going to do with this presentation is to expand a little bit the, the, the frame of the discussion, if, if it is possible. I don't know if Enrique will want to, to expand it or not. I mean, um, <clears throat> well, thank you, Enrique, for coming. It was, um, we were really nervous a couple of hours ago. So, so thank you very much for, for arriving, not for coming, but for arriving. Um, well, I think dualism uh, sounds like a kind of marginal or, or a strange topic for our um, architectural exhibition, and probably it is. Uh, and I think that uh, it's a strange topic, in fact, and uh, it's apparently trivial. Uh, we, uh, we haven't thought in terms of dualisms when we were doing these projects, that's for sure. I mean, it, it came to us, which is why it became an exhibition. We wanted to expose the fact that many times design techniques are hidden to, to, to our mind. I mean, you just work, you just do, and then discover that there is a kind of repetition 
in the way you f you confront different topics, and there are, there are some similarities. And obviously, there are differences, and are, are not stylistic similarities. Are similarities that uh, have more relations. It's a deeper relation. Have more relation with the technique you are using, with the way you your mind works, than with the gestures or the codes or the compositional aspects of, of architecture. And this is the case for for this um, exhibition. So. <clears throat> First of all, I, I, I just want to say that uh, in, in philosophy, in metaphysics, in, in religion especially, dualism had a, a long, long history. Uh, I, to, this morning I was just googling uh, to, to, to see the definition. I have never thought in, 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 in the definition. The definition are two. Uh, Dualism was originally coined to denote uh, co-eternal binary oppositions, which is nice. <clears throat> and the other is a system that contains two essential parts. This is what Google says. Um, it doesn't say anything about how these two co-eternal oppositions um, live together. I mean, and it's, it's, it's not about... Uh, the only thing we know is that we don't uh, think in, like Hegel in dialectical terms. Uh, we don't think in, in a third leg of the system uh, kind of synthesis. In fact, uh, for us, the most interesting thing is to maintain the position of the poles, to maintain a life detention uh, created by things that uh, cannot merge into one thing. This is, I mean, I don't know why, but this is how it happens. <laughs> uh, so they are condemned in a way to live together, uh, being uh, different. I think that this is, um, let, me, let me put you another image. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, it's the, this is the drawing that uh, made us uh, uh, constant of, of this technique. I mean, in a moment in the, in the office, we, uh, I asked it another way, do you think that the M40 project has the same scale than the Locronio. Why don't we compare the sections? And we just uh, compare them in the screen. And I said, and the too high, which is the third one. Let's see uh, how it, it, it relates. And, and we saw this and said, I mean, what happens here? I mean, there is something that is happening. I mean, this is the origin of, of, of this exhibition. So <clears throat> I think that this um, uh, dualism, the idea that the projects can be done with uh, maybe uh, radically two different things, has an aesthetic effect that is not related with beauty or ugliness in a kind of, 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 of clear way, <clears throat> uh, but can this be described as, in a way, as bizarre, provocative, sometimes absurd, sometimes surprising, attractive, maybe different, or just curious. But uh, the, all, these, all these words have a, a genealogy in aesthetics and, and, and can be rooted in the picturesque. And, and also there is a lot of, of, of um, stuff made in the beginning of the 20th century by the vanguardists that it was very provocative, that had this idea of the absurd, the surprising, the different, or the bizarre. Obviously, we have also the wonder cameras and all the romantic idea of, of, of what a mission should be about. But um, <clears throat> it's about dualism is about form. Uh, this is uh, for sure. And it's, and it's about form in plural. It's about forms. But it's not only, uh, it's at odds of, 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 of uh, a synthetic uh, form. Uh, it's, it's about uh, forms living together. And at the same time, it is about form and, and formalism. Is it, uh, it is about, uh, I would say, performance, which has in, inside the, the word form. Let me, let me explain this. I mean, the, what we discovered, it was, again, something that we discovered after doing the, pro the first project, that was the first project Renata and I made together. Uh, when we, we call it the floating potato, and when we, when, when we discovered there was this kind of, of, of duality among something that was super, uh, let's say, uh, slender and connected with the exterior climate and the supermassive floating potato, we discovered that the duality had a kind of interesting thermodynamic performance. You always need to capture uh, like the, the differences in climate and to store something. And this hybrid materiality 
has a kind of uh, technical immediate purpose that has become for us a kind of important issue after doing it. No? And, and said in other words, in thermodynamics you need sources and sinks. You need flow. I mean, it's the, the, about dynamics. You need one thing that is different to the other in one way or another in order to create these dynamics. It's a super simplified version of what thermodynamics is about. But it implies at least two things, which is what I wanted to make the emphasis in. So, <clears throat> Um, so, and, and this is the first duality, no? uh, form and performance, and uh, the cultural and technical uh, understanding of form uh, creating a kind of uh, tension in the way we, we design, no? or, or we pretend that the design. And, well, and let me say that uh, with, after this, this kind of uh, quick um, approach I see to, 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 to the, uh, to the uh, um, three sections that are the core of the exhibition. I, 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 I want to escape from our exhibition and, and make a kind of travel in time and space beginning in Boston. And then we will go to modernist or to contemporary architecture or to historical architecture and come back to, but we will be always connected with Boston in one way or another and, and particularly with the GSD. <clears throat> like, this is the first, the first, um, we go to Copley Square, and we uh, see the, the, I mean, I want to present the, the two most fascinating places in Boston and Cambridge that we have found in these years. This is amazing, the, the relationship of the Richardson yeah. Trinity Church and the, and the Harry Cop, uh, John Hancock, no? uh, that all of us know well, and uh, we all know how closely these two names are connected with this school. Um, uh, uh, obviously, uh, there are many, many interpretations of, 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 of the, this duality that is created in time, but at the same time it's a clear dialogue that doesn't try to merge in any way. You know the, the, how it is turned, the Hancock is, is turned in order to allow to see the uh, lower part of, of the church. I think that also there is, I mean, a, a simple explanation. The first time I saw it, I, I thought, and I, I continue thinking that it's a kind of NBA basketball player, a gigantic player, standing to leave an old lady dressed in a traditional attire to sit down, or no, something like that. It's a kind of a kind of respectful attitude of a down with an old lady around. But at the same time, I think that is <clears throat> this image. I like this image because it's, uh, it's, it's the relationship of these two buildings with with nature is completely different. No? The Richardson is completely rooted in earth is absolutely material, while the John Hancock is, is obviously in dematerializing. I mean, there is, one is connected with earth and the other one is connected with the air and almost uh, floating. And I obviously think that you can imagine how much this, this reference of seeing both together can, can be informing uh, our first project, then 14. Also, you see in the first row, McKean, Mead, and White, that mm, some like a lot. I, I, th I think it's completely boring, and, and it's like Duran in doing nothing in the middle of a drama, a beautiful drama, you know, that a, a bizarre drama. Um, I mean, well, anyway, it's also Europe and America, no? and, and, and this is important. No? Uh, for me, it's... it's uh, uh, Trinity Church is, is completely rooted in the Romanesque, in, in, in Spanish Romanesque, while the other is the probably the most the, the, invent, the American invention, no? probably the last American skyscraper properly, no? uh, the dematerialized, uh, beautiful um, uh, John Hancock. Uh, so, so uh, in a way, it's a dialogue that that exists. Uh, and another duality that uh, is permanent in the not only in our architecture but in the architecture of, of so many, no? and and philosophically one is clearly connected with transcendentalism while the other is connected with minimalism. I think that this all these dualities are have, uh, create a kind of interesting uh, tension and interesting not only geometrical but uh, conceptual material in every order. No? That that and this is the other one. In, in Boston, another person that is clearly connected with this school, no? Jose Luis Sert, the house he made a couple of blocks uh, away from this 
auditorium and 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 the interpretation we made when we visited this house for the first time, which is amazing, by the way, super small and really attractive. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's really strange to pretend to use a patio or a courtyard, if you want, in the climate, in this beautiful climate we have outside. <laughs> no? and, and <laughs> but, the, uh, but the thing that, we went in May, and I remember, and, and visiting Ines was uh, the, our special collections librarian facilitated us this, this wonderful visit. And when we arrived around, we began to smell wonderful Mediterranean pines. It was completely different, the smell. And we saw the seven pines that you see around the house that are drawn differently, that no one pays attention to and that uh, immediately understood that w were planted by Sert and Moncha, his wife, as, and the owners of the house uh, that knew them w uh, quite well said, yes, absolutely, they were fascinated with the smell of these pines, etc. So I, it, it's, it seems that it's a, maybe a detail, but, but for someone that, that uh, uses the house, it's not a detail, because the house is obviously it's a patio house, it's very in, in, uh, uh, thrown into the interior space, and you only have this kind of windows that look always to different pines. You don't see any other thing but pines. So, uh, and then the thing becomes uh, more serious. I mean, w uh, this, these were made by Colin, these photos, this photo, so, the other day. <laughs> and it's difficult to, because there are, there, there is, uh, it's very difficult to, 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 to make the photographies showing all the pines. But if you want to visit the house, remember this, and you will understand how much this idea of, of combining uh, some, I mean, first of all, it's super crazy, the idea of coming to Boston with a house that uh, is in emotionally connected with Ibiza, which is where he had the, the summer house, a patio house surrounded by pines. No, and so, so he really wanted to bring here something that was completely, in terms, in thermodynamics terms, completely absurd, but in cultural terms was completely consistent. I mean, I, I can, I would like to, to be smelling pines too. So, so I, I understand quite well this. No? And <clears throat> but at the same time, uh, I think it's a beautiful idea that we have used almost literally in, in too high, no? to use the patio as a typology that is immediately connecting with uh, uh, almost a hot climate, a hot and humid climate, and, and the trees that, that in our case are artificial, but have some relationship. Well, and then we go to another GSD hero, our virtual REM, and, 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 that, and, and, the, and what is the, I would say, the epiphany of, of, of contemporary architecture, can I say this? I mean, I think it's the, really, the, for me, it's the project that changed the situation, from modernist and, and other epiphenomena to a really new thing. Uh, uh, probably if it were constructed, as many times happens, it would then be so magic, but it's amazingly magic, no? And, and it's, it's also the, the, I would say, the anti-skyscraper, because it's, it changes the proportion and it's completely internalized. In the, the whole excavation puts the focus inside in, instead of in the exterior. The, every modernist uh, skyscraper is about the slenderness and about control and vision, don't dominant, dominant vision. This one is exactly the opposite. But at the same time it, that it, it reverses the whole tradition of um, skyscrapers, paradoxically, is, is a kind of build savoir. It's literally Le Corbusier. So it's, it's the promenade, there's a excavation he makes, creates, I mean, I, I call it the roller coaster promenade, no? because it's, it has a loop in the upper part. No? And, uh, but it creates a incredible tension among this es es excavated, uh, uh, and, and the mass of, of information that creates a kind of solid cube, or uh, that, that is the only relationship with the exterior. In fact, the facade is completely banal. It always reminds me another great architect, Jacques Tati. Remember me playtime when, when 
you only see the reflection of, of Paris. I mean, here you don't see Paris at all. Maybe you remember it was a kind of very banal drawing of a cloud in the facade. I, I haven't brought it. But I mean, all these, all these paradoxes, all these contradictions with the typical uh, tradition of the, of the, <clears throat> and, and this, uh, of the high skyscraper, and at the same time, the relationship with Le Corbusier, and the same, at the same time, the relationship with Paris, for me, are creating very interesting uh, paradoxes and, and, and dualisms that uh, have some relationship with other references. I remember that when Peter Cook gave his lecture, he mentioned Ludwig Leo in, in Berlin, this monster, this is a real monster, a beautiful monster, a pink monster, in fact. And, and I mean, technically, has a relationship with the canal, but, but uh, it has remained for many decades in Berlin as one of the most interesting and attractive uh, uh, buildings you know, in the city because of this brutality of the scale. And I know that Rem likes it, but I, I need, know that he likes it literally. I mean, and, and, and there is a kind of relationship in the Whitney, another beautiful, one of the best, in my, in my opinion, of buildings of Rem. <clears throat> Uh, again, uh, uh, the, the dualism, the tension, no? the kind of, 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 of intensity that is created. Um, well, now everything will disappear. No? But, but I mean, the, the, the Whitney, the original Whitney, and the new one. But also the Sokal or the or, or the um, yeah the Sokal of the brick ha house. No? The three elements in this case are incredibly tension. In a way, reproducing with the connectivity, the, uh, reproducing a little bit of the Ludwig Leo and a little bit of, of the library in Paris. And then another virtual professors of this school, uh, Erzog and, uh, and de Merom, uh, having an incredible uh, dualistic project, probably their best, uh, with a promenade inside that uh, if we go back a moment and look to this, and then we go to this and to this. Uh, in a way, we can understand there are some relationships. The supermassive, in this case, is hotel and office space and whatever, excavated with a promenade, an incredibly smart promenade that probably you remember, and the, and the opera, and the stratification of the materiality and the relationship with the sea. I, I think it's, I mean, the complexity of the whole project itself is, is an amazing experience of how much dualism is, is, is uh, embedded in many of the works that, and many of the authors that we admire and that we think that are creating the contemporary culture. But we can jump into history a moment, very quickly. I don't want to give any lesson having Michael Hayes or Antoine Picon here. And, 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 and Diocleciano in Spalato, the beautiful Roman palace, and, uh, one of the most beautiful Roman palaces. And, and the history, I mean, this is dualism in time. Many times happens, no? I mean, time creates uh, differentiation. And, uh, this is before and after. No? After the Roman Empire, the Gothic uh, uh, use of the ruins of the, the, of the Diocletiano Palace, uh, creating one of the most beautiful features of the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Here is a, a Google image, and, and here is the, the view uh, of this mm, reuse of almost all the elements that were important in, in the Roman period, completely changed in scale, use. The, the, what was a temple has become a plaza without the roof, so it reversed the, the use of space, etc. Et and we go to Cordoba, and we have uh, another, I, I know Jorge Silvetti is, is one of his favorites, but we have commented, and Rafael Moneo, by the way, uh, the, the mosque of, and, and cathedral of Cordoba, located in the Roman Forum. Uh, so uh, it has three strata. Uh, also, the, the, the Morris construction it had uh, a lot of um, uh, sections in time. But then when the Christians came in the, in the right side, uh, they wanted to have a, a church, a cathedral, and they, they respected in a way, not very much, but they respected the rhythm and maintained the, the whole uh, composition, creating a brutal duality that is probably the most interesting thing that this uh, uh, building has. It has a lot of many, uh, a lot of things that are interesting, but you can see the, the complete 
difference in space. I mean, the harmony, the geometrical harmony, and the complete differentiation in space. The horizontal, dark, horizontal uh, space of, of the mosque and the hypostyle uh, room and, and, the, and the verticality and the light of, of the other one. But also you, you can see the minaret transform into a campanile th through changing the top, the roof, the hat, whatever you call it. I mean, and, and, and as in La Giralda, that so, much, so deep influence had in the American deco skyscraper, by the way. So, so the idea that uh, all these ingredients are dual, dualist. It's a pity that you cannot find in Google any any image of the mosque without electric light. It's, it's horrible because when you switch off the light and it takes you like three hours and paying a lot of money to the guy that is <laughs> there, but then it it is uh, incredibly beautiful. I mean, it's, it's very dark. You the arches disappear, uh, like a kind of evanescent material, and then. In the middle, the, the cathedral, the, which is Renaissance, Gothic Renaissance, a kind of hybrid, has a kind of, a, a kind of a brutal explosion of, 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 of light. But at the same time, you can see the, the, you know, the, how the, both styles, both forms that are so difficult to put together are able to establish a kind of pact and live together. This came to the to, to this uh, other building in, in Spain, El Escorial, that, that assumed that a cathedral can be part of, of the Diocletian Palace because it has the same size of the Diocletiano Palace, but with a cathedral in the middle, uh, mimicking Michelangelo, but with a very small tomb. And, and, and well, uh, I don't want to talk about talk too much about this, but I don't want to extend myself, but I, I just want to say that in this case, case again, the roof, the pitch roof, doesn't have any relationship with the climate of Madrid. It comes from the family, the Austrian, the family of, of Felipe IV, so that brought the Nordic uh, roof and became a style, uh, something that is now everywhere in the area. And we, we jump into these two guys. I, I think you know them. They haven't taught in the ESD, uh, but they were the quintessential modernist. No? Uh, and, and, and they together, uh, had a lot of uh, uh, connections, especially the Corbusier mimic all his life Picasso. He wanted to be Picasso, basically. I mean, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> and and and, but it seems that they are in Marseille, no? Looking to the Unité of Marseille because they look high, no? But um, I want to say that the dualism that what I see that relates them is that the, probably both of them are among all the modernists, the the ones that were more connected with uh, what I call dualism in time, the idea of expanding the timeline. I mean, they were always going back to the tradition and always pushing forward. I mean, if you, if you look, the most interesting things that uh, uh, we, we remember of Picasso are always in the tradition of the Mediterranean uh, uh, culture, the Minotauro, even if it looks like Duchamp, the guitar, the model and the painter. And all of these uh, uh, traditions are, are, are uh, used, model, and, con and constructed with uh, completely different techniques. Many of them copy. Completely, co I mean, he was the master of copy paste. I mean, everyone hated him. Matisse, Cezanne, all these guys, because he copied all of them. And Juan Gris, and he was much better. <laughs> um, um, the most important dualism I learned from him was his houses, the, the way he lived in uh, the amazing relationship, his studios and his houses in the French coast uh, uh, had among the objects and the way he colonized the houses. And it's almost ridiculous the way his paint is hung on the wall. I mean, considered seriously, it looks like a, the, the, the room of a, let's say, strange, uh, guy, no, <laughs> and, and 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 he's famous underwear, uh, and 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 the way he he connected uh, these two things with a kind of naturality in his mind, I think, is not only me who has learned. I mean, I'm, I remember Enrique Miralles. I think he learned everything from the, his these photographies. If you consider this, uh, you will understand many many things of Enrique Miralles. And Le Corbusier, the, the best, uh, the master, the king of dualisms. 
This, especially with his books. This title is marvelous, it's wonderful. I mean, it's, it's a manifesto itself. You don't need to read any page. I mean, uh, and if you, for example, look to the house in Santa Monica of Frank Gehry and the Guggenheim in, in Bilbao, or you look to his Bill Savoy and the United Nations in, in Switzerland, you understand that if an architect is able to connect the most simple, the most, the poorest house and the palace, then the whole thing is resolved, no? The whole system exists. And this is, this page in particular, I have the Spanish version, by the way, in this page in particular is, is the strongest manifest of architecture ever made. You don't need any other thing. And in reality, the tension established among history and the future, static and mobility, the fragile and solid, all the kind of dualities that you can imagine, technique and, and memory, et cetera, et cetera, are established in ways that are unforgettable. And this one that has been uh, many times misunderstood, in my opinion, uh, as, as because of his connections with, with the, say, the rightist after the war, I think that is a very interesting uh, page. First of all, he's the only architect that has used thermal engines for a manifesto ever, so the turbines uh, here. But secondly, I think that uh, this, uh, I agree with, with, with the proposition of architecture or revolution. I think that is a very important thing. I mean, if we think about the politics today, or we think about, I don't know, uh, the Mediterranean and all the uh, occupancy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But not only that. I mean, you, if you think about history, you think about the phenomena of urbanization in China, for example. Uh, architecture of, or revolution is a very interesting proposal. I, I, I don't want to enter into this other thing. I, I just want to finish this with the last uh, Rams uh, manifesto, dual again. It's the only image that we all will remember of the of the Biennale of Venice, I think. And it's a very interesting question mark. Uh, uh, where are we? We are in the, let's say, the junk space. Uh, everything is small and um, driven by air conditioning. Or are we in, in, in the history of architecture where form, matter, ornament were in the driving forces? Or are we in a conflict and we will be unable to resolve this duality? I think that uh, uh, in the book that we are presenting with the exhibition, that we are presenting only the book without the cover, <laughs> because we'll come in, as happens always, the last day of the exhibition. <laughs> it's a, it says on um, thermodynamics, architecture, and beauty, we have a kind of uh, uh, um, manifesto that is dual, obviously, which is uh, about some uh, uh, thermal engines related with uh, uh, matter and form that is incredibly strong and, and connected to history. And these dualities uh, uh, allow us to explain, I mean, it's a kind of, uh, in fact, uh, uh, it's a kind of proposition of a studio, an implicit proposition of an option studio or a super studio, I don't know. But in the uh, duality of these thermal engines that is inherent to the topology of these thermal engines and, and in the dualities that we see in some other uh, historical uh, uh, formations of architecture, maybe there is a kind of uh, third term that uh, dualism can resolve and can allow us to change this kind of, of dead end that the last image of REM um, shows us. Uh, I don't want to explain them because they don't have uh, a kind of a very technical relationship. It's more an emotional relationship. Can we really establish something deeper than just an emotional relationship among the upper and the lower part? Well, this is the question mark, and this is all the presentation. Thank you. <laughs> do, we, do we sit down? Yeah. Not the wheel. So, Enrique, well, 
now um, say some few, a few words. Okay. You, you can begin. First of all, thanks very much for the for the invitation to to basically conduct the conversation this week, but also the in two more weeks uh, the question of design techniques. I'm uh, grateful, honored, uh, and particularly given the the topic of design techniques, that it's uh, one that has been uh, quite important to me for uh, a while as well. So. Um, I was preparing notes uh, from uh, the material of a forthcoming book, um, some of which have been addressed with your presentation, so I'll, I'll probably be uh, shorter than expected. Um, but um, perhaps the, the way in which I'd like to start is by, um, by in fact asking what prompted a conversation of design techniques in your work, and why today? What? You want to respond? You start. <laughs> <laughs> in I think that the GSD uh, is the, I can say it in, uh, do you hear me? Yeah, no? Uh, it's the school that uh, maintains the vitality of design on top of any other thing. I think that this is the most remarkable thing that I have found when I came here, and I feel completely sympathetic to this idea. I think that architecture is really about design techniques and, and we can always talk about many other things that are around us but the th core of our discipline is how do we design, why we take decisions as we take these decisions, which are the reasons why we take these decisions and not other decisions. And these questions that seem like simple are never mm, um, on the table. I mean, uh, we have big, big words theories that are abstract, generic, and we take, uh, no, we take, we thief them from philosophers normally, a little bit of the less, a little bit of this and that, and, and then there is a kind of black hole, and the projects come to us, and we all distinguish which projects are good and which projects are mediocre, but there is no, no, there is no way to talk about them. So I think that focusing on design techniques is a way to insist in the specificity of uh, our um, uh, profession and the intensity that um, uh, making this square or round means in so many orders of life. This is why I'm interested. It's also, I, I assume, a, an, an important effort at basically bridging areas of design and, uh, and theory that have been for quite a while uh, understood as separated. And I think uh, that's also kind of a, a sequel to, to the question. The, the effort that it implies to make an argument about the interplay between the two rather than the acceptance that has happened in academia for a while, um, that they are basically two separate. Well, you, you are one of the few that uh, has been insisting. And, and you, I, mean, I, think, I, mean, I, I think that <coughs> your contribution is with this insistence in, in the notion of cliché, is in preventing so many students of, of just using topical languages or just being a critical in the way they, they, they formalize their ideas. No? And I think that it's another way. You've been like kind of, 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 of lighthouse saying, more, hey, don't go in this direction, go in, stop. No, uh, it's another way to, to, to be focused in design techniques. No? Very interesting, by the way. Yeah. There's actually very, been very few architects who discuss design techniques in the past few years. I mean, I, I, for many years I did interviews, in fact, as you may remember, with architects, and it's a topic that has uh, come again and again, but very few uh, discussed it. Um, notably, Rossi was uh, the architect who was after developing a treatise to the point that it would become a design theory. Um, he didn't go as far, <laughs> but he attempted. <laughs> he ten yeah. yeah. And it's, it's fantastic because it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to go too far away. And, and I'm sure that with these design techniques symposia, we will probably find the same frustration. I mean, you cannot go too, too because it's, 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 it's not, uh, I mean, the linearity of the discourse, the verbal discourse, doesn't have a close relationship with the, I would say, the simultaneity of, of the way we take decisions when we are designing. I mean, there is a, a difficulty in speaking about how you design. I mean, and mm -hmm. y you remember some books that, uh, I mean, I think the, the, the writers, logically, they talk uh, a lot about the techniques they use to write books. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's about the discourse, it's linear. Well, our thing is, it's like spatial, it's in, in once everything, boom, that's it. This is the project, no? And 
And, and this makes it very difficult to talk about the same techniques. And I think this is the, one of the reasons why we try to escape to. Mm -hmm. Now, going specifically into uh, the, qu the question of dualisms, uh, the exhibition and the title of the exhibition, would you say dualisms is a design technique or is rather a definition of what design is? I mean, you develop it uh, a bit more in the upcoming book, uh, which I had the, the, the privilege to, uh, to read. Uh, He's the only one. Uh, and, uh, and you basically discuss there that synthesis is impossible in design, which is also kind of a no problem. In other words, that when you design, you confront a number of variables that do not have as an outcome a possible synth synthetical object. Um, so is, is dualism um, a sort of tension that you pursue as a quality of design, or simply what you have to go through when you design? No, Renata. I think it's a, it, it, it is technique of design. I think it's a, it can provoke the design. It's a kind of provocation, like starting point. And um, it makes you start to uh, have a kind of map of a project. Mm -hmm. One, you put this dualism or two things together. This dialogue between both of them start the story, let's say. Mm -hmm. right. And this story can be worked in sketches, can be drawn once and again, can change form, can change ge geometry, and fin finally, Stop in one moment. It's like uh, when we project together, let's say. You know? It's like it's one moment that both of us, we know that's it. You know? It's just this, it, this will be the project. You know? uh, but it's, I, I don't think, even we talk about techniques, this is not like kind of predefined, has a beginning or has the end, but uh, it's um, kind of continuity and has a lot of pragmatism and techniques, but on the other side, also a lot of intuition. And the mixture of both, uh, I think, is very important, at least the way we are working. But also, I, mean, I think also it's very important the fact that we are two. So dualism yeah, yeah. is implicit in the fact that we <laughs> <laughs> It's very simple. That was my last question, which I've been just deprived of. But, uh, but uh, I will have to look for a different ending afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, but, I, but I think you know, it's, it's, it's like, I don't know, there are other architects that, that work together alone in, in perfect harmony with themselves. Right. <laughs> and we work together in imperfect <laughs> disharmony. Yeah, it's so basically a productive <laughs> tension in the yeah. work. Yeah. I mean, the slide that you showed, I think, is a very argument to what you, you just said, that it is uh, a design technique. But I think that's also the emphasis on the fact that uh, a product, by definition, is a clash of variables that cannot have a, um, a clean outcome. Um, w would you like to um, describe how you exploited some of these uh, techniques in your projects which are out there? For instance, Logroño, which I think is a very good example. Yeah, no, I, th uh, I can. I mean, I, mean, uh, I think that uh, I have to. Uh, I mean, they have their genealogy. Logroño is so closely connected to M40. I mean, there is a, a series of steps. Of, of frustrated steps, uh, competitions that were second prize or not given any prize to anyone that was even more frustrating, <laughs> and so on and so on. And then, the, uh, uh, so, so in a way, there was uh, uh, in Barcelona we had to improvise in a weekend a, a kind of proposal for Arroba 22, and and we just I remember that we just cut the the. The project, by the way, M M M40 was the, the, the thesis project of, of Renata, and we had to cut the potato plops, and land it, puff, and present it, boom, in, in, in it was brutal. Right. It was received, I mean, it was the, the most negative uh, discussion we had <laughs> ever. And, and, but we liked it, and, 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 but seeing it just the middle of this is, is the beginning of the Logroño project. I mean, we said, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, and, and when, when the Logroño project came to us, we had a, co it, it is uh, a competition. Uh, uh, Andrew uh, uh, Gois, that is teaching now, is, was one. Rem was another one. And Alejandro Zaira was another competitor. I mean, it was, 
uh, Rotterdam against us, everyone from <laughs> Rotterdam, and, <laughs> and, and all of them, and we decided that this was the occasion to do this project because we knew all of them were going to make a super iconic uh, train station, like boom, the thing, no? And we were sure that the, the, this was not the right way to do it. So, so we just made the, the hill, let's say, the uh, kind of slope and another slope. And, and the, because the important project was for the city was that the, the transformation of the city, instead of having a wall uh, that separated north and south to create a kind of park that connected everything and created a kind of new belt, green belt. No? And this gave us the, 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 the so, so it was a strategic. No? Right. But in addition to, say, the, the shed and the park, as Stan Allen discusses in his article, there's also the kind of grotto, which is extraordinarily yeah. light uh, at the same time. So that, that's also another level of tension. The question I, I, I basically have is whether, whether some of the ideas were um, um, triggered by the projects or whether some of these ideas applied to the projects. At which point did you have the finding of, uh, oh. of the dual? <laughs> what, what did you basically find, uh, as you showed now, with the three slides, that this was a, an issue that was current in your work? I think it depends very much in who, who responds. <laughs> we could have a, a dual response. Yeah, dual response. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, in my case, it was the, my interest in the picturesque as, as a theory, uh, aesthetic theory, uh, that uh, began to modify my first interest in in a revision of, I mean, the European, Swiss European revision of modernity that was very, very much uh, an issue of my generation. And I, be, I, I began to read uh, Avidale, Price, and all these guys that are so smart, were so interesting. So I, I recommend everyone to read these this books, like Three Essays on the Picturesque of, of Avidale. Because it, it, it's impossible to think that they are living in the 18th century. It's exactly the same criticism, the same sense of humor and, and, and paradoxical thinking. And, and, and I became more and more interested in all these uh, features like the Wunder Camera, the Grotto, all this stuff. And, and in my uh, uh, vision, uh, Renata came uh, and just began to work and made it. And I was like, what? I mean, like, <laughs> and, and she hadn't read this. I mean, so, so it was just her thing. No? I mean, and so, so this is why I think that it, my approach is super in, intellectual or rationalized. Her is poorly designed. I'm wrong? You said everything. Do you want to reverse <laughs> the problem? <problem? laughs> no, I, I, um, yeah, I, 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 you were saying, talking about the Pinterest. I was thinking also about the heritage of modernity, the park and the towers, which is very present. I, I would maybe tell much more of this story. Um, yeah, I think it was very special for us to bring back this project and put this uh, M40 project together with Suhai and Logroño, and they would make like kind of they make like kind of series of, of projects, not kind right. of line or kind of obsession that repeat once again. And this M M40 project, what we meet again, um, what we meet first time, sorry, um, that um, somehow both of us uh, we have seen like projected in in this project, this duality between the potato, organic potato, and the prisma, completely extreme uh, contrast between two of them. Uh, probably from my side, it was much more intuitive. Um, I would say from Iñaki's side, it's coming much more from modernity, you know, park and the towers. And the, these park and the towers come back in Logroño somehow, completely different way. But the same obsessions repeat once, once and again. Now, where I like it, I mean, let me remember, I mean, I don't want to be like, oh, but, but, but <laughs> what I like it of the project was that every time that we are together with this project, she surprised me with a paradoxical, Approach. So the towers, I thought at the beginning that were going to be like a curtain wall, glass, transparent. And then I discovered that we are made of concrete. They are almost blind. They are wrapped in a mirror and, and they are like very thin, very thin, very thin. <laughs> so it was like a kind of bunker. No? I mean, it really like, it was a surprise. And then the potato, uh, I discovered that it's a hotel and the lobby is in the middle of the and it's open air. It's a garden in open air. I mean, it's a, 
lobby in Madrid in an open I mean everything was completely contradictory with the same the, the very first image and, and this for me was a kind of uh, uh, discovery of, of because I, I, I think that I was too literal uh, as an architect till this moment. Yeah, I, I, I learned a lot with this project. What what would you say was the contribution of the studios you taught uh, on the subject? Because for, for a number of years you taught uh, systematically a number of topics yeah. that were basically uh, gathering material that was eventually to be uh, used for an argument. Would you say some of the of those studios basically? Um, also um, contributed to the, the argument? Yeah, I mean, I mean, depending on when, I mean, they have always been related with what we do, and that they began to be exploring the potential of, 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 of the picturesque in, in many different typologies, in those type of typologies that you, do your, you don't expect to apply, like the skyscraper, and it was, uh, but then we began to be more and more interested in the thermal implications in the, in, of this differentiation and understanding other implications that, had, that were much more technical. And we began to abandon all the, the interest in, I shouldn't say this, in tectonics. I mean, I'm, I'm not <laughs> that much interested. I mean, we have wonderful structural engineers. They resolve everything nowadays. So, <laughs> uh, and, and, and we're more interested in, 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 in the thermodynamics of, of the relationship among mat different matters or different forms or the organization of the interior versus the exterior. Creating in, uh, up and down, interior and exterior, I mean, creating differentiation in many different ways and extracting from this differentiation attention that could, I mean, one of the things that we learn and try to teach is that uh, we need to have techniques to escape from the determinism of context and typology. This is, this is a good formulation. I have never formulated like this. <laughs> I mean, so uh, creating a struggle with a kind of a dualistic struggle is, is destroys the, the determinism of whatever program, whatever site, you have the site and the program, and then you have type and context. No, no. you put in the middle of this thing a new battlefield, and you create other things. And maybe you create a new context, or you create a new prototype. No, right. but this is, this is the, the kind of lesson that we have learned teaching. <laughs> but it's also curious, Iñaki, that you're saying that you, there is kind of abundance of uh, structure uh, coming to thermodynamics, but I think it's not like that. But the story, it's much, maybe much more funny. No? I think somehow we are coming back to a structure through thermodynamic. Yeah, sure. It's when we start to work with materials in the uh, kind of thermodynamic data and condition. These bring back another kind of thermodynamic, which is a gravity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this dualism of uh, how respond the material to, to the energy and to the heat, but at the same time to the tension to maintain the, the gravity, this duality, it's also that we have like kind of on the table. Let it me makes see. completely loop from coming from the structure of, uh, oh. <laughs> of a skyscraper, an American uh, skyscraper coming back to understand it very different way. Yeah. Let me put it in other terms. Uh, is the moment of the project. I hate to begin a project with the structural grid. I think if you, uh, it's always 8.4 by 8.4, by the way, the car part. <laughs> right? yeah. if, if, you, if, if you draw a grid, you are killed. I mean, you will not find any good idea. So the moment of the, the thermodynamics is much more interesting to put it in the beginning of the process than, than structural or tectonic or whatever. Dr. Kamp. <laughs> Along those lines, I was tempted to ask, but I was hesitant, uh, whether there's a number of implicit conversations with uh, recent debates in the field. Because if there's one issue at play with the question of dualisms and the negotiations that it implies, is really uh, a critique of optimization. In fact, that there could be one system that smooths out all uh, possible uh, variables and that can, in fact, uh, address and understand design as something that could be optimized. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, in, in, in our case, I think that when we came, or I came as a chair, uh, I had to bring a word. I decided it was thermodynamics. I mean, I think it was the right word to bring. But uh, I, I don't want to be a caricature of myself. I mean, I, 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 it's not everything at all. I mean, I'm, I'm, 
uh, uh, an architect that is formed in a very classical way, I understand, appreciate history, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, form, and all these things. And I think that uh, um, the, the idea of, of, of dualism is able to bring nuances to every single discussion that you can have on architecture immediately. It, it puts another um, rule in the game that destroys determinism. And one of the determinisms, more obvious, is to, to associate the interest in thermodynamics with the uh, immediate interest in optimization. While maybe it's exactly the, the opposite, it's the perversion of optimization what is interesting when you control thermodynamics in a building. I mean, it depends. I mean, the, or creating a, a, like, um, experiences, uh, a differentiation of experiences that only uh, are, are multiplicity or, in, or, or to multiply the diversity of experiences, thermal experiences or uh, air experiences in a building. There are many ways that are different uh, to optimization. And, and, and this is why uh, I think that the exhibition has a kind of also a role to say, um, is, uh, uh, be careful. I mean, uh, the words uh, are, are very tricky. No? When we always try to associate dualistically uh, thermodynamics to beauty. No? Uh, and we, you remember that we had this 2G issue that was this, this was the, the, the text that we prepared was about thermodynamics and beauty. Because they seem to belong to two completely different worlds. And I don't think they belong to two different worlds. No? But, but uh, never try to use the word optimization because it's the most bureaucratic and stupid word that you can bring to discussion. Yeah, but also it, it could be eventually considered as going, uh, being at odds with design. Let's say the, the grid for the parking may be at odds with the grid of the office tower, which is above, which is in fact the topic of uh, REM's uh, library, let's yeah. say. Um, um, and therefore it has to be negotiated. Not, or let's say you have to solve uh, the difficult hole, as Venturi would call it, to refer <laughs> to a similar topic. Um, would you also discuss this as a sort of sensibility? I mean, it is a sort of, if, if you go back to surrealism and their hero, Lotte Raymond, it is a sort of yeah. the, the... Your favorites. Yeah, my favorite. <laughs> one of my, there's a few favorite uh, around this area. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to repress them, uh, but now I couldn't refrain from <laughs> the, the, the chance encounter, the umbrella and the sewing machine on the dissecting table. The fact that basically two objects by virtue of being together could become ecstatic. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that this, I mean, I don't, I don't know the response of Renata, and will be different for sure, but, but uh, I, in my education, as in many of us, uh, this moment is, is, is crucial. No? This moment was uh, so radical, so innovative, so disruptive, as now we all say, and, and, and at the same time, uh, uh, so uh, intensely, um, connected with our need of gain and, and perversion of things. No? And I think that uh, I, I think that this moment uh, were uh, playing with, uh, by the way, I mean, Picasso, for example, he, he played with, with the Bourgeois. I mean, he made horrible paintings. Mm -hmm. It was super ugly, no? I mean, but he had the strength to force the world to, to look at them as, as beautiful. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. He was a, provoca a provocateur. No? I, mean, in, 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 I think that this, this moment uh, is, I mean, you can read it as, as now, and everyone would go to the museum and see the Avignon mademoiselles uh, as if they were. They were horrible prostitutes painted completely drunk, and, and that's it. I mean, and, 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 and it was the beauty was there. No? And, and, and I think that uh, understanding deeply the modernity of Picasso uh, which has been my hero for many decades, <laughs> uh, 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 obviously, uh, is, 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 is incredibly uh, important in the education of an architect. <laughs> At least to have a master. You can choose whatever you want, but I would recommend everyone choose a good master. Right. In fact, <laughs> it is the cornerstone of a sort of 20th century sensibility that a montage and two objects that basically, by clashing, uh, introduce a sort of third reading. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hesitant as to whether I should continue or open it up for questions in order not to yeah, kind of, uh, it, probably we yes, should open it up yeah. to questions. Mm -hmm. right. Neil. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah uh, Renata and Ingaki, I noticed that outside you had some books on display. Um, yeah. And as a theorist, I couldn't help notice that Deleuze <laughs> and Guattari were down there and, and Aristotle. Actually, it would help my argument if it was Plato. Um, 
but I guess, I mean, I, in terms of, of dualisms, there are many different kinds of dualisms. I mean, we get from, from Plato the, 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 the Platonic kind of dialogue and the dialectic, which is a kind of oppositional thing that feeds into um, the binary oppositions of structures and so on. But we get from Deleuze and Guattari a very, very different model, um, which is not about oppositional thing. It's about evacuating the space between the, the two and... Um, about a kind of shuffling. It's about a becoming, a becoming other. And we know examples from Deleuze, the wasp and the orchid, and it's like in the way that the owner becomes like the dog, or the dog like becomes like the owner. It's a kind of process. And, I, and since we're talking about techniques, I want to just kind of raise that question about the working process itself and the relationship between the two of you. Um, because it strikes me that the kind of that's, that's an important part of, of what an architect is um, and how they operate. And the particular example I want to raise is, is since you mentioned him, uh, is uh, Enrique Mirales. And, and, and let's not forget Kame Pinoche. And I think that really, and that's the kind of really important part of Enrique Mirales <laughs> as far as I was concerned. Because it was really that the kind of the, I don't wonder what, I'm not sure what the word is, what the dialogue, the, and it wasn't synthesis, but it was the, the it was probably a Deleuzean word you have to use anyway for it, that I think really made their work amazing, and once they separated, I don't think anything that either of them did was as good as what they had done beforehand. So I guess, I, I mean, I'm interested in, in the, nation, the, the nature of your working relationship. Is it this kind of antagonistic, kind of tennis match kind of thing, or is it more the kind of Deleuzean um, process of, of becoming like each other. And <laughs> Let me say that it's, I would say that this is more uh, uh, it's difficult. We discuss. I mean, we. I mean, I'm, 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 we are not going to play the typical American couple designing that they are perfectly harmonic when they give lectures. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of them, and uh, I haven't seen any discussing, any couple discussing. I remember Florian Beigel, by the way, discussing with Philippe Cousteau. It was amazing. Ten minutes discussing among themselves. Why do you say this? It's wrong. I mean, <laughs> in the middle of a lecture. We, we don't Fighting arrive to this limit, control. but in, in, in reality, I mean, I mean uh, uh, it's strong. So, so we discuss in, in strong terms. I mean, what you are doing is bullshit. I mean, this is the kind of, of normal uh, language. And, and, and then comes the other. But uh, as, as is, as, I mean, so, so it, it's a kind of fight. But in the moment that there is an idea that uh, we look at each other and say, oh, that's it. I, I, we don't know how it comes. But I'm sure that Enrique and Carmen had something like that. I mean, it's uh, the, the fact that you have uh, other people, uh, other person uh, in front of you, uh, forces you to, to have a kind of, 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 at the same time, to be strong, and at the same time be receptive, and, 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 and be awake. I mean, you, you have to have all your anthems there, and when there is an idea, jump, take it. No? I think, I don't know. Or oh, oh, for looking. For all looking for, for the idea, no? because you start to draw, and if you are alone, probably this idea, you don't know exactly where to stop. No? But if you have somebody in front, and it's like, there's some schedule, but it's like, you know, it's, it's not yet. No? And so it's like again and again and again and again. And also, you, you have this other person that put in critic that it's not yet. No? So the, this dialogue brings to one moment that it happens. No? I used to be the asshole that has an idea in the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's not if I could add something, you, you mentioned whether, it's, whether the dualism is antagonism or something other. And the M40 project, I thought, was sort of uh, illustrative of something, which is that it's tension between two things, but it's also a mutual dependence, where the potato doesn't stand up without the towers, and the towers would fall over without the Oof. potato. And there's a thermodynamic dependency as well. So I'm wondering if you see like, the um, mutual dependence and tension as somehow related, where if you lose the mutual dependence, you also lose the tension and vice versa. Or is the tension something that can exist without them being dependent? <laughs> I imagine it's both. Yeah, uh, I mean, M40 project is very special, no? Because it's uh, like taking to the extreme. I mean, everything is taken to the extreme. Like, uh, even it looks like very abstract. The structure it works. I mean, it's quantify how how thick should be the tower, what is distance between them. But on the other hand, it's like taking to the limit. It's a bigger distance. The more slender tower, it's rectangular. So it's like when you take decision, the decision is take to be different one from another. You know? 
and there is this potato that its topography of potato is created through the car. It's a, it's a road that defines, so they are even two scales. So in this process, almost it's like the interaction is because of neg negative relation, you know? like saying if you are like this, you are like that, and it's like repeating different steps you know? in geometry, materiality, proportions, scale, uh, whatever. You know? So uh, they are just together. There is no. It's when you make monster, let's say, you no, know, it can happen that one thing start to infect another. There is kind of interaction. In this case, they are they like they would not see each other. So there is no interaction, even they are together. But there is the line, it's perfectly drawn. Antoine has a question. Yes, it's more. It's more a certain degree of theoretical perplexity. Uh, let me try to explain. You know, I used to be very critical of my calls uh, rapture with dialectics, but for one, you know, one of the interests of dialectics is that you have one thing, then something that is opposed, and then you have the synthesis. So when you do dualism, you might argue that actually it's more, you know, you're more respectful of the play of differences, that you don't close the system, etc. But actually, aren't you closing the system on a, a difference? and not allowing, because one of the interests of good old dialectics was to enable other types of contradiction to emerge. So you see what I mean? Uh, so <laughs> in some ways, you know, don't you by the end create something that is even more systemic, etc. And I was really struck by the fact, you know, I was thinking, you know, if you're really dual, du like dualism, is thermodynamic the best model? Because thermodynamics, you presented a lot of engines. And engines are closed upon the repetition and, you know, the fridge, et cetera, et cetera. And that system. You know, and, and, you know, the, all the mechanical uh, balance or tensions, et cetera, you know. So I was really intrigued by that. Yeah, well, I mean, perhaps it might be the contradiction that you're aiming at. Yeah, no, no, I, I understand. I mean, I, I, I like to say that it's not, uh, we don't uh, play Hegelian uh, games, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, when I talk about thermodynamics, we are creating systems. I mean, and, and this is what, what, what uh, from a technical point of view, no doubt. I mean, and and in fact, uh, the mm, the processes are uh, when 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 the proposal is interesting, the processes of, of of refinement of the system, how do you adjust numerically or in terms of proportion, this to that is 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 the main struggle. So in a way, uh, I'm, I'm lying in a way. I'm not in, in formal terms. We want to maintain the differentiation in formal terms, but they have to perform as, as a system. That's for sure. Yeah. I'm sorry to, to say this. Sorry for lying you. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Thank you. Uh, yes. <laughs> You, you, guys should be asking, you guys should be asking <laughs> questions. Yeah, yeah. We've trained you to ask questions. No, this is, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about either Hegel or Deleuze, okay? Um, I want to ask a question about the, it, the, the, the preponderance of sectional drawings uh, in the exhibition, in the lecture, was really striking to me. <clears throat> and I don't quite know how to ask it, but it, it occurred to me also that I was trying to think, I was trying to put the picturesque together uh, with that. And it occurred to me that in the picturesque, and I'm thinking mainly of paintings, the only time you see section is, and you do, but the buildings were in ruin. I'm thinking of there's a Turner painting of a, of a chapel that, <clears throat> that is in this amazing landscape, and the landscape is important in some of the projects too. The combination of landscape and section always has connotations of ruination. And I'm trying to figure out if there's, if ruin can be um, generative in, in, in some way, with some allegorical way, I don't mean yeah. in some allegorical way. But, but maybe a way to get at that is just, uh, maybe Renata, do you draw in, in section in the development stages? Do you think in section in the development stages? Or is that a presentation 
thing that comes no, no, later. Abs absolutely, yeah. in the, during the design. Yeah. I think the, the, this is um, important for us, and we didn't. I, I, uh, I'm happy you bring this subject because I think the documents we choose for the exhibition. They are kind of reflection of uh, what are our tools or what are documents we work along of a process of design. No? So the 2D drawings like, like plan and sections, they are very important for us. They are very present from the very, very beginning. Uh, so some normally uh, the 3D uh, first process is by hand. Uh, and uh, we are very carefully defining both of them. And I think it's a very important tool, the section, not only uh, from, uh, I would say, discipline of architecture, but also when we talk about thermodynamics, when we talk about landscape, when we talk about uh, inter 3D interrelation, uh, materiality also, or geometries. Uh, this is a document, it's very important for us. I, I think also that, that uh, in, in relationship with the, the, the ruin, I, I don't, I'm, I mean, uh, we have insisted many times in the interest of the grotto, but, but so, so that is so closely connected, no? And then and, and the effects, the, the, this immersion in natural elements so deeply affects our body. But uh, uh, I think that uh, has the section allowed you to compose uh, uh, complex uh, relationships while the plan is about internal organization. And, and, and one of the problems that with the new techniques we use, uh, let's call it by its name, Rhino, is that, that uh, uh, the uh, moment of the section is, is um, uh, uh, leftover is a consequence. It's, 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 not, it's not an actor, and and that is amazingly. Uh, uh, I mean, I think that is responsible. I mean, I don't have anything. I mean, I have things against Rhino, but I don't. I, I think that every technology has its, its own limitations, and, and so, so. But the limitation of, of not designing through sections uh, is amazingly um, um, poor, poor in the sense that that, that you don't have, especially. In, in, and this is why I, I imagine that has a relationship with ruins is because I conceive the, the section as, as a still life. I mean, it's a painting, a kind of painting that you connect uh, landscape, you connect organic and inorganic, artificial and natural, and you compose a unity with, or, or a duality if you want, with all these things. And, uh, and the section is the main instrument to, to negotiate all these differentiations and similarities. I mean, that's for sure. And, uh, to be honest, I think that one of the reasons why the architecture has become so iconic, now everyone pretends not to be iconic, but, but in these last decades, uh, is re related with the fact that if you compose a totality, you are composing a, a face, uh, you are composing, a, I always say the American architects compose self-portraits and the European make still lives. Uh, we relate, the American just compose a beautiful, uh, Face and 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 what? Well, <laughs> I leave it here. <laughs> Scott is looking to me. <laughs> Perhaps we have one more question from a student. From a student, maybe on this side. Yes. Yeah. Right here. Well, thank you for the presentation. I I found it very interesting because it was very much rooted in the cultural identity from where you come from. Um, so my question is, in the, in an age of globalization, how, how is this cultural identity informing your techniques of design? Is it, in, you know it touched base a little bit when you talked about Legronio, scale is one issue probably, monumentality versus something small, but I wonder whether you go even deeper in that and read it and are conscious of it when you're designing. Well, first of all, she's Polish, I'm Spanish, so the, the <laughs> duality can, comes immediately served you know, by, by the national identity. No, I, I, I don't think that is, I mean, well, let me respond in these terms. I wrote about, uh, it's a pity that Anne Lacaton is not here today, uh, but I wrote a text on, 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 on Lacaton and Basal uh, saying, uh, explaining 
how much pretending not to be French, they have become the most French architects. Uh, and, and I think that this happens. I mean, uh, I remember I, I, my obsession was, uh, when I was a young architect, to escape from all the discourses of, of national identity that in, in, in hidden be, be, below Rossi and all the postmodernist sequela that was very poor, uh, were in filtering you know, a kind of, of, of let's say, uh, rightist ideology of identity, etc. And, and I was like, oh no! I mean, I, I, we had I, I couldn't use a brick. I hated the. the, the, the <laughs> uh, it was like, and, and and I think that it was super important for for at least in my case and Avalos Herreros, the first let's say uh, office that we had, uh, uh, to escape from this kind of of. Uh, uh, need of, of um, affirmation of identity. It comes naturally. I mean, it's like when when Dali said to the painters, I mean, uh, don't pretend, uh, don't, don't lose time pretending to be contemporary. It's the only thing you are condemned to be. I mean, so, so don't pretend things that naturally will come. This is my response. Ah, yes. So one last question. Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, for you, dualism is opposition, and then you emphasize that when you compose this architecture, the two opposition has to remain different, like different. So there are two poles that generates the dynamism. Then there, do you consider, for example, when Van Burko he has this uh, face that is like a compose of man and animal? You know that picture yeah. that is like looks yeah. like a man, but also animal. But then it's one. At the same time, do you consider this also as dualism? But they becoming merged instead of. It's a morphing, yeah. It's yeah. a merge. Yeah. And then the third one, I mentioned that um, opposition. I mean, contradiction or dualism is not opposition, but two things. For example, two I this I influence. I was influenced by this. For example, two stairs next to each other. Okay. You know which one I'm referring yeah, to. <laughs> and uh, that is not opposition, but a doubling. Do you consider this also as dualism? So uh, let me say that uh, uh, when you go out, read this. I mean, we have, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we have tried to make a very small uh, essay on dualism. And, and we say that there is a kind of physical and a, or, or a chemical. chemical. Uh, dualism, the chemical would be the Ben Van Berkel, is where the scars and seams disappear and you have the continuity, which creates other kind of monsters. The physical is my favorite, is Frankenstein, with all the scars and uh, so with, with the brutality of the fight, in, 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 obvious in the shape, in the final shape. Uh, but I think that both are, are doable and uh, both are interesting and, and it depends very much in if you are fascinated with uh, algorithms or parametrics or not, I mean, or you are interested in the contrast of materiality and, and the performance uh, and of different materials and different forms. You know? so, so you, in a way, for me, uh, it's more interesting to, uh, to, to express the, the, the differentiation, like in the Ludwig Leo uh, building with the, the pink huge tube uh, you know, supporting, so to say, the, the more regular office space than trying to make a kind of, of, of solid uh, discontinuous. Um, um, I, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I think that the interesting thing is to, uh, uh, to, 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 as I have said, to escape from determinisms that come from the obvious parts of architecture, the, the, so the program, Economics, all the all the kind of rhetorics that the uh, architects use to escape to their responsibility to create a, a new culture, a new beauty. I think that what what uh, I would add to what you were saying that uh, we do not see any necessity to create like fur thing, the uh, Van Berkel image. You know? Um, this is like the, this is not our aim. This is not what, what we are looking for. So, and personally, I think it, uh, I'm interesting much more 
that these differences maintain somehow, because maintain the tension. If we create the third thing, this is kind of a process that you would say this is my kind of way of working, but I think in our case it's exactly opposite. It's like uh, there is this ambiguity, how much similar or how much different these two elements are, and you never know uh, when start or finish the other, how much they create the system, but still they, might, uh, then they maintain the, the difference. No? It's not this, so it's such extreme like M40, but in, if you go to Logroño and to Zuhai, to the other two projects, you would say this kind of composition that works together, but you know that it's constructed and you can perceive perfectly the differences. No? Or, or the dualism of Logroño when you have like this confusion between the triangles of the park and triangles of the structure and the ceiling. No? Different materialities, the same language, but is it the, the answer of chemic mixture or not? No? I think it still maintains two elements. Separate. Thank you all for being out. <laughs> last, last, last. <laughs> Victor. Yes. Well, Renata, Iñaki, thanks. This last uh, question, um, in a way, was quite strange to me because I think your idea is not about Frankenstein. And it, it can be about Frankenstein because Frankenstein is a collage. And your uh, dualism is not a collage, it's more like a Marcel Duchamp display in a way. No, it's, it's about things that you can recognize and they are separated in a way. So I will say it's more close to the still life, no, this Renaissance still life that you can feel the fruits, not the fruits all together. And some, they make like a face or a head, but they are different things. And it's beautiful because it gives the idea of the world. There are fruits of different uh, times of the year. So it means that also it, there are poles, you know, there are things that are quite separated. So I was, uh, in a way, I think um, Frankenstein doesn't give that kind of distance that maybe this, uh, and maybe uh, just this is a gift, no? Maybe you can use that instead of Frankenstein. Okay. <laughs> but Dep depends. If we are with clients, we will use a still life that is more elegant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it's, it's a very good point. I mean, uh, it's true. But I, I, I think that the attraction of the monster, the, the, the use of the name monster is, is also, in, in academic environment, is really important. And we have insisted very many times how much the use of the category of a monster uh, um, uh, creates, uh, liberates, I mean, it creates a freedom in the student to not to, to, to have to deal with beauty from the very first day. Beauty is something that will come later. I mean, you have to deal with, all, to deal with other kind of processes. You have to deal with more complex processes in order to arrive to a new idea of beauty. No? While if you uh, immediately begin to talk, for example, about uh, still life, you will say, ah, Morandi, everything is with the same color, pim, pam, pum. It becomes a little bit about delicacy, materiality, and all this boring stuff. No? So, so it's true what you say, absolutely, but I think I, I stubbornly insist in the fertility of, of, of using monsters and dualism as categories. With that, we're going to move the conversation <laughs> out to the lobby and um, wrap up. So thank you all for being here, and please thank. Okay, thank you.